Yeah, so I think we can now we can start. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Um, we did not expect that many people to come actually, so that's why uh, there was like not not that much space in this room. Usually we're like I don't know ten people. It's like the best day. Um, so yeah, thanks again for coming. Uh, today uh, I want to talk a little bit about MLIR, and this is like completely introductory topic uh, because I myself still learning it, and uh, I'm gonna give it by an example of compiling Ruby uh, with the MLIR. A uh, few words about myself. So my name is Alex. I'm uh, working for GitHub. I do have blog. You can also find me on Twitter. And important disclaimer: I have some side projects, but they're not affiliated with my uh, day work. And the projects are, the first one is practical mutation testing and fault injection for C and C++. Um, it's related to LLVM and Clang, but not related to this, to this talk. Uh, the other one is actually uh, deeply related. It's called Dragon Ruby. And the Dragon Ruby is a uh, kind of combination of several projects. There was one called Ruby Motion. It's an old project and uh, it had different logo in some yeah, years ago but it was acquired by uh, another person and I'm now part of this team and been maintaining Ruby Motion for several years. Uh, so the Ruby Motion is a ahead of time compiler for uh, targeting uh, iOS, Android and macOS mostly. It's uh, like tightly coupled with Objective-C runtime and JVM runtime. Um, uh, there was another project, like in a product, uh, which is called Game Toolkit. It's like simple, uh, kind of two-dimensional uh, engine, like 2D uh, engine for building games in Ruby. And it's targeting like many platforms like macOS, iOS, Linux, Android, Nintendo Switch, Play, uh, PlayStation, yeah, Xbox, and uh, we are now working also on the VR support for Oculus Quest. And so the difference between these two that uh, the Ruby motion is ahead of time compiler. It means that you give it Ruby code and it spits out uh, complete executable. So I think I can show you, uh, use this slide as an example. So like difference between compiler and interpreter. Uh, so the Ruby motion is a compiler. Uh, you give source program, compiler takes the, some runtime libraries and spits out uh, executable that is ready to be run on the hardware. Um, and the GTK, the Game Toolkit, uh, it's interpreter. So, uh, and the difference that interpreter, it contains the runtime within itself. So in our case, if we want our users to actually ship their games to their users, uh, then it looks kind of like this. So we provide the game engine, which is partially written in C and partially in Ruby and uh, the users of our game engine, they take, they, they build the game, they write it in Ruby, and optionally they also write it in C. And if they want to ship it to their uh, users, uh, like the final game would look, would contain the copy of our runtime and our interpreter. Um, I was actually like in this specific part, I was mostly working on the C extension support. And there I kind of found the problem I mean, not a problem, but I made it a problem for myself. Uh, like, how do you optimize this stuff, right? So the C runtime of the game engine, we can fully optimize it with all the sort party libraries we use because we do have access to all the source code. Uh, for the C extensions, you kind of can optimize them, uh, but not really because you can only optimize your C extension. You cannot compile it together with the runtime, uh, with the engine itself. And so you have like two optimized parts, but they could be optimize even more if we could just combine them together. Uh, but this is kind of okay-ish, uh, but the big problem that uh, all the Ruby code, that uh, the game engine itself, like parts of it in Ruby, uh, the game itself is in Ruby, and this code is like almost not optimized at all. So I thought, okay, like how can I solve this problem? So if I want to optimize all of it, uh, what do I do? So the answer is obvious, like I should write a compiler. Um, and so how I thought this, this compiler could look like that uh, on one side, uh, like you see it down below here, uh, we take the runtime, uh, compile it to LLVM, and then uh, on the other side, we take the Ruby code. Uh, I translate this Ruby code to the C code. Then uh, the same path, basically uh, also C compiled down. Then it's like all optimized together and it's great. You get super fast executable in the end. Um, so this is how it looked like, I think, 
it's not this one. Yeah, uh, this is the compiler uh, that I wrote originally, at least like part of it, it's not like fully functional and uh, it's pretty straightforward. So the idea of interpreter that uh, you get the bytecode and it just like some set of instructions and operations like do this, do that, do this, do that. And uh, interpreter like in the virtual machine of the uh, Ruby, they have like huge switch statement that checks which kind of operation it is and then does something. So I just replicated this and for every instruction, um, for example, load, like load self, I use uh, Clang APIs to build, uh, so this is a wrapper around the Clang APIs to build the, to emit the C code. Um, oops, wrong one. So for such a program in Ruby, uh, the C code looks like this. So I'm kind of abusing the C notations. Uh, so uh, these labels are needed if I want to, to have go tools like branches and so on. So this is like, if you know the compiler internals, uh, like general theory that this is the control flow graph and uh, this thing can be seen as basic block. Um, so it works kind of okay-ish, uh, but then for some simple instructions. Then I hit another instruction uh, that was about exceptions and don't try to read what's happening here. I'm just going to show you like how terrible it is. Um, so just to support the exceptions uh, across like one body of the function, I had to invent some like custom things like uh, some additional data structures like vectors of hash maps and so on and so on. So it's like really terrible and uh, hard to understand, hard to ma maintain. And uh, later on, I hit another instruction that I could not uh, handle like this anymore. I had to uh, do some analysis of the whole program of like other functions. And then I would have to do like sort of uh, yeah, analysis on the AST level because here I'm building the Clang AST and it's not very convenient uh, and super friendly to use. So then I thought, okay, I should probably write better compiler and a uh, better compiler we can write with MLIR. And it's, it's this thing here. So now instead of targeting C, I am targeting MLIR. Then this MLIR uh, thing, I'm gonna explain what it is in a moment. Uh, it can be lowered down to uh, LLVM bitcode, and then it again links together, optimized, and just uh, you get an executable. So, and uh, in a nutshell, what is MLIR? Uh, it's a multi-level intermediate representation. Um, so uh, what it means is that uh, it's just a framework that allows you to build some intermediate representations. Uh, so you can think of it as kind of JSON uh, thing with like some JSON schema on top. So that uh, the great part of it that you can combine different dialects uh, you can have like completely different dialects. You can then convert them into some uh, other dialects. You can mix them and match. Uh, and then in the end, you can emit uh, whatever you can target, like uh, CPUs, like with LVM IR, some GPUs where, uh, with uh, NVVM, and yeah, whatever your mileage may vary uh, IR uh, with something else. Yeah. Um, I should have mentioned that, uh, but I'm telling this now. So we're gonna have some live coding uh, just to give you a glimpse of what is MLIR and what does it mean, like all, all this stuff. So I first I thought that we should just uh, write this very simple compiler from scratch, but uh, that would be a little bit too much. So instead I, I built this, like created this project. Um, I guess I should make the font bigger, right? Uh, where is that? Custom fonts, okay. Is it? No, it's some, some other fonts, right? Yes, under editor on the left. Yeah, there is some presentation mode. I never used that. Um, okay, let's say twenty. Is it better? Can can I see something? Okay. Um, 
Yeah, then let, let's fill in a couple of blanks. So what does it mean like to have Ruby, uh, to compile Ruby or write, run Ruby? So Ruby has, at least MRuby has a C API and we can create, uh, we can just use C, create a C program that uses that API. So for that, uh, all the Ruby uh, functions, they have this signature. Uh, yeah, that's not gonna go well. Yeah, so they, they take uh, whatever MRB state, this is kind of the state of the virtual machine uh, and some, some argument. Um, so we can call this thing here. self equals uh, top self. So yeah, by the way, uh, if there are any questions, uh, meanwhile, just ask them. That's, that's right. Yeah, so in here we can we can implement something and uh, I would suggest like the simplest thing to actually just call a uh, function like hello world to do hello world with um, some number just to print some number. Oops. Yeah, I think this is the first time I'm doing uh, live coding and it shows. Yeah, signature. Um, so this is the receiver goes first, then the name of the function, and then number of arguments. So if we build and run this, we should have 42 printers. Yeah, so it works. I have a question. Yeah. So what you're right now is C code, right? Yes, it's a C code. And what exactly is the Ruby part? Uh, there is no Ruby part in here. Okay. So this is just how you can use the Ruby API, Ruby runtime, to build, uh, yeah, to write programs. Okay. Yeah. I see. So uh, the end goal is, is actually to take the Ruby code and create this, like emit this uh, machine code that would do exactly like exactly the same thing. Uh, you're writing the interpreter to to do these things. Then. Yes, yeah, sort of, sort of. Okay. Yeah. How, how was it? Yeah. So this is just uh, yeah um, to give you an idea, like what what does it mean? So what when, when you write uh, in Ruby? I don't know if you know Ruby, but uh, the Ruby piece of code would be like this like puts 42, it will do exactly this thing. So it will just print the 42 on the screen. Um, so yeah, the next step, what I want to do is actually show the MLIR, what's the MLIR is. And we are like completely switching from Ruby now for, for the time being. Um, so who knows what LLVM is or LLVM IR? Okay, so yeah, m many of people, but uh, not everyone. So uh, LLVM IR or LLVM bitcode, it's kind of container. Uh, there you have like top level thing is a module. Module contains several functions and the functions they contain several instructions. So uh, MLIR follows this uh, philosophy and we can actually have the same uh, thing here. Uh, so we can just replicate some simple MLIR concepts uh, or LLVM concert concept from um, with MLIR. Yeah, should. Uh, yeah. Okay, I think like this, builder, create, mm, module, operation. Um, yeah, so everything in, in MLIR has a location, so I should just create some, some sort of location. Um, Do. 
Okay, so once we get the module, we can print it and see what's going on there. Oh no, wrong targets. Yeah, so you see this, the, the module. So now, uh, yeah, we'd like to, or I'd like to fill it in to create some function, builder, create MLIR func op. Yeah, so this MLIR, MLIR things, uh, there is standard dialect that contains uh, lots, of, lots of things that are useful for pretty much any compiler. Like, yeah, like this one. So the function we use top in this case in the Ruby code and I'm gonna use top here as well. Um, yeah, I should create the types, I think, somewhere. Yeah, so this is the annoying part. Uh, because it's using some template, whatever, metaprogramming magic, I cannot see here exactly what's the arguments uh, this operator expects. So I should always go down and look at the list of arguments somewhere here. And this is, yeah, oh, no. this is annoying, <laughs> like super annoying. Um, <laughs> function type gets yeah at least for the function type um, I can I can I can see this stuff here um, type yeah integer type whatever 32. And 64, just for an example. So something, yeah, does not compile. So it's unhappy as well. Um, I think this would, this should make it happy. No. Okay, yeah, wrong order. Yeah, so I created the function, but it's not there because I should add it to the module, actually. Okay, so yeah, we've got something here. Um, I will just a little bit like uh, fast forward uh, because uh, mm, yeah, because it would just take like a lot of time and you will get bored even more than you are now. Yeah, so uh, here what's what we have, we have some standard operations like module and function, but um, <clears throat> for, my com for my compiler, I actually want to use some non-standard operations uh, and types and whatever, and how do I do that? And here we get to the meat of like MLIR actually. So uh, it's TD, uh, I think it's called table definitions or table gen definitions. It's a DSL uh, built by LLVM and it's also used for MLIR. So it looks like uh, like any other program, but it's only used to describe things. So this is uh, like declarative thing. Uh, so you cannot like really run or execute this code. Um, and what you can do with that is you create the dialect itself. Uh, it just, um, it's, it's kind of container for everything you have, like types, operations, attributes, uh, whatnot. Um, so here I yeah, mentioned, so yeah, Ruby, like they're like, yeah, in a nutshell, there are like two types, MRB state and MRB value. And uh, this is like everything you operate with, uh, more or less. And so for my dialect, I want to have state uh, and value types. So I just declare them here explicitly. 
and then uh, time, uh, time comes for the operations. So here I can define an operation which is load self and this operation it has arguments here and in this case it's just one argument state of type uh, state type and it has one result uh, and the result is value type. Uh, so what is interesting about this ins and outs uh, that um, here you actually define uh, kind of graph. So you don't define like some arbitrary operations or instructions. So you define a graph and this graph can be interconnected with uh, anything else. So here it basically means that uh, input, input edges, incoming edges to this node. Uh, so this operation is a graph node. So the incoming vector uh, edges are this one has this type and the outgoing uh, edge has type uh, value type. So yeah, I wanted to write it uh, manually, but uh, that would yeah, be annoying. So here are uh, two examples like load self. Uh, it just does nothing. Like basically this uh, operation just returns some value. And if we want to have some, provide some uh, other parameters like constants, for example, then it's done through the op uh, attributes. So here load I op, uh, it's yeah, it's an instruction that loads an integer. Um, here, like slightly more complex uh, call operand uh, that takes like a few more arguments. And if you look like super close to it, uh, then this signature looks exactly like this one. Yeah. So the state receiver or. Uh, no, actually, sorry, I meant this one. Yeah, so this uh, MRB func call, it has uh, state, receiver, name of the function, number of arguments, and then the arguments. Yeah. And then this is declaring the signature, like the, the MLIR table gen definition is declaring the signature of your function of your entity. yeah yes yeah you can think of it like this yes yeah it's not exactly signature it's not exactly a function it's just like high level concept of something yeah uh you can think of it as okay it's a function but it doesn't have to be a function it can be a constant okay and, and this constant will have type uh one parameter which is incoming edge of type whatever integer yeah and what exactly do you do with that? Like, what is the... Why am I doing this? Yeah. Um, no, I mean, uh, no, no, where exactly does it matter in the process of translating Ruby to MLIR? Like, um, how, how is it used? Are yeah, you... I, can, I can skip one part. Okay. Yeah. Uh, or, or, or uh, you, you get to it later. Yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah, so, okay, I'll, uh, I'll not skip it, but I'll take uh, like again, a sidetrack. So the goal of the compiler is to uh, parse Ruby code. Okay, uh, parse, yeah. Parse Ruby code into um, AST. Then AST, I need some IR, I need, I want to convert it into some intermediate representation so that I can do some analysis with, with that. Once I get the IR, I can then lower it to convert it to LLVM IR or LLVM bit code. And then I can convert it, uh, like compile it to the machine code. Yeah. Okay, so um, you let me think how to make it better now. Okay, I do have uh, Ruby out called. So, the question? Yeah. So, the goal was supposed to take the Ruby code and method one to run to the MLI. Yeah. So we create 
Ruby in MNIR, kind of. Yes, yeah, sort of, sort of, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, let me try to build this quick. Okay, works. Um, yeah. Um, just a moment, it will be a little bit clearer now what I'm doing. Um, okay, so let, let's just skip this part, I think. Context and okay, no, uh, module. No, this is wrong, uh, Ruby. Okay, byte go to MRB. Oops. Context and so I've got the input file here. See if that works. Okay, it does. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, let me take a sip. Yeah. So, um, what I wanted to do originally is I wanted to first like recreate it like step by step, but it just taken like much longer time than I um, expected. Uh, so we're gonna skip some part of it and we'll get to the kind of last part so this is the whole thing that uh that i wanted to, to show that uh we take the ruby program and we get the byte code of this ruby program and it looks like this then uh with mlir i can create this program um in in this form so like lot i lot self and so on so on and this is MLIR, like purely MLIR. It has nothing to do with uh, anything. Uh, it has nothing to do with uh, machine code, with whatever GPU, CPUs, like anything. It just just some text. Um, and then with this text, uh, what we can actually do is we can convert uh, every instruction uh, to another dialect. And in this case, uh, we can uh, MLIR has LLVM dialect. So. Let me show you just that. So this is the original module and now we can convert it to LLVM. I think this should work. No, it doesn't. Yes. So it cannot, it says there is an error message that it cannot do the conversion because of, uh, it failed to legalize operation MRB lot I. And it happens because uh, it's not implemented here. But we'll do it like real quick right now. So this is how the conversions between different operations uh, work. So uh, I think there are like, must be some other way uh, because it, it is a little bit like verbose and like lots of things are happening. So for every operation, I have to declare a new class and say uh, how exactly do I want to convert it to, to another dialect. Um, yeah, in this case, Let me just move it a little bit so that I can get help from Git. Yeah. So in order to load, uh, to, to convert this load integer operation to, um, to a LLVM, I want to create a LLVM function uh, that has a name load RT load I, for example and it gets the MRB state as the argument, uh, at the first argument, and then it has some whatever number type, uh, 
yeah, as another argument, and it returns a value. So once I do this, so this is all, all I need to do, like in this like super small case to kind of uh, convert uh, operation from one dialect to another dialect. I also need to register it somewhere down here. And now it should work. Yeah. So this is the, again, bytecode from Ruby. Uh, now this is the MLIR module and it uses MRB dialect that I created. So this is like custom, completely custom dialect. Uh, the next one is LLVM dialect. It's also uh, MLIR. Um, so now once I have uh, it lowered to convert it to MLIR dialect, I can do it like once again uh, and lower it to LLVM to the actual LLVM bytecode. What was the difference between the um, MLIR LLVM dialect and the LLVM? Dialect? Yeah, let me get to it again. Um, yeah, so the difference that this is again, this is like MLIR, and MLIR is just like concept. It's it's an idea, like you have something, like it's kind of JSON, right? It's it's not executable code. You cannot do anything with it. You can convert it to other dialects. You can transform it. You can analyze it. Uh, you can remove instructions, add instructions. Mm -hmm. But this is just like a high level concept. Okay, I did not see that there is this function top, for example, that has like percent zero, one, two, three, and so on, which lo looks a lot like LVM IR. Uh, like it's a yeah. static single yeah. assignment? Yes, it is static single assignment, yes. Uh, yeah. But this is not everything. There is also notation that I don't understand. Yeah, because it's it's not uh, LLVM uh, IR notation. It's uh, MLIR. It's super like similar because, I mean, same ideas, like built by the same people, roughly. Um, but it's kind of just graphical represent representation. What, what I find weird is that you cannot um, lower your Ruby MLIR dialect directly to LLVMIR. Why do you have to, to take this intermediate step to have the MLIR dialect for the LLVMIR? Mm, yeah, I think I can do it, um, but I don't want to. Because so the LLVM, like this MLIR, LLVM dialect, uh, transition from LLVM dialect of MLIR to LLVM IR mm -hmm. itself, it's a tricky part and there are like many things uh, that I don't want to do. So the, this like simple program, uh, we only have kind of instructions one by one, but there is also standard dialect uh, that has some constants um, and it has nothing to do with like LLVM dialect. Uh, there is also a CF dialect, which is like for control flow, like branching, if, else, uh, etc. And I don't want to kind of convert this this down to... Uh, mm -hmm. It's easier to, to emit this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I just emit this, like I'm reusing the existing infrastructure and just emitting this part. And uh, so for example, this address off, like I didn't have to do it. Like I just say that, okay, like make the function call to this function and that's it. Mm -hmm. And if I want to lower this to LLVM, then I have to use whatever get element pointer and yeah. so on, so on. Yeah. And like this is super like yeah. fragile, annoying, and I, I don't want to deal with that, um, but it's possible because- But is there a standard infrastructure to generate this piece of code from your MLIR dialect? Or did you write, you, you wrote this on your own? Uh, which part exactly? You mean this? The, the, conversion. the, the conversion. I cannot find anything. Uh, I mean, I did find some pieces, like uh, there was this TD, TD files. Yeah. Um, here you can define operations, you can define types, attributes, and you can also somehow define those conversions. Yeah. I just could not make sense how to do it. Like I could not find it because there is like not that much documentation and uh, existing uh, dialects. So basically I had to look like, or uh, if you want to learn how the others do things, uh, then you have to look at their TD files and figure out yeah. what's going on. Okay.
Yeah, so, but I'm really looking forward to, to learn how to actually not write uh, all this code and I will tell you why in a couple of minutes. Or maybe, uh, yeah, just sneak peek. Yeah, because uh, this is like we're just building like tiny thing, right? Uh, with like three instructions and uh, in my like more production ready, uh, I got like many more instructions. And these are not all, so I have, I've got two dialects of my own. Uh, mm. One has like 100 instructions uh, and the other one like maybe 80 operations. And I have to lower uh, all of them kind of one by one. And it's not fun. Um, yeah, I think if I just scroll down, just all in one file. Um, that looks like a lot of yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, this is annoying. Uh, I can tell you for sure. Um, some parts I know already. Like, okay, I could like just you know use one instruction instead of like three instructions for this because the lowering is just the same and they're just set effectively the same instructions. Like, this is true. Is is false? Uh, they are identical, just calling different function. Uh, but yeah, so this is the way it is. Um, um, question. Yeah. So this. The file describes the syntax of a valid AST. What does it actually do? Uh, it it describes uh, because you're talking about edges, and that's why I'm wondering where the edges are coming from. So, um, like what it might be an AST. Got... So this is not an AST exactly. This is uh, yes, yeah, it's like more of a graph. It's what? Graph, uh, like but graph but with but no sense. What, what does the graph? Hmm? What does the graph represent? Uh, it can represent your program, for example. How? So, uh, if you have, for example, this, puts 42, then uh, one node is 42. Um, yeah, or actually, yeah, I mean, here, here, this kind of example. So, okay, uh, note, first node is 42, and ins is empty. Sorry, where is that? So there is like no incoming edges into this node, but the outgoing edges is, it, it's just a type. Right, it's like I sorted two in this example because it's a, it's a number, right? Does it make sense uh, so far? Do you have an op operator for that in uh, defined uh, uh, number uh, operator? Uh, here it is. Uh, well, not here. Yeah, exactly. Not not exactly this, but I mean kind of this because it, like if we think of this as Ruby, everything is an object or MRB value, so this is uh, not a number but value. And the other node in this program is puts, and it has ins. There is one object, or one edge is a value, and what goes out is another value. So this is what uh, what you define in the TD files. Then programmatically you create uh, so this is yeah defines the kind of nodes and edges between those nodes uh, but then you programmatically can create this thing uh, the the program and so this is actually where was it so this is kind of graph like textual representation of a graph of your program but isn't what you just uh, wrote, isn't that basically the syntax of the AST? Not necessarily, but... It's the syntax of the bytecode, right? You, you start with Ruby bytecode and you analyze this and transform this into your L MLIR dialect, isn't it? You, you don't work with the Ruby source code. Yeah, 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 I don't. Um... So what you try to model with MLIR is the uh, control flow in the byte code that you read in. Yes, and yeah. This is simple instructions. Yeah, it, it actually it could have just been AST. I could have modeled AST in the same way. Probably. So, uh, yeah, probably. Um, 
what I want to emphasize that it's uh, so saying that it's kind of AST it's a bit limiting because it's more than AST and it's not just a tree but you can represent more uh, things for this do you have a concrete example when it's not an AST what is AST uh, AST is uh, it's a tree right uh, yeah. abstract syntax tree yeah, yeah. and uh, so but are there examples where you don't want to have a tree where it's like actually like a where you have a loop in your graph do you want to have that um, well I think like any reference is is a loop effectively so if you have recursive function call it's it's already a loop it's already kind of graph because you're using the other like the same function you're like referencing yourself uh, okay if you, okay so you're talking about the control flow graph. yeah control flow as well yeah yeah in the AST normally uh, it's kind of I think like the AST is a bit like misleading in general because in case of the recursive function you kind of have a tree node that is a reference to a declaration and that in fact actually goes back to uh, to the other uh, tree node so it's also kind of graph oh, but do you have an example for a loop in, in this uh, TD language so for example if you have a function that calls a function then you have uh, in the incoming edge also a function no no you don't have that um, Yeah, in this case, I think, where was it? Uh, symbol. Yeah, in this case, so this like create method. Um, yeah, in in MLER uh, context that you would just get some attribute that is reference to another function. Can you repeat that? Uh, yeah, so the question was uh, if there is an example of like how the loop yeah. looks like, right? Okay. And so it, it looks like kind of like this. So you get the, you get a reference uh, to the other entity. So it's like a keyword symbol, right? Uh, it's a type. That you, that you define yourself? Uh, no, this one is coming from the kind of standard library of MLIR, okay. but I could have defined it myself or any other attribute. Okay, and what, what does dollar method mean? Uh, that means the name of the argument. Because then, uh, so from this code, uh, MLIR generates C++ code. So the one we've looked at it, do I have it here? Yeah, I think. Oops. From the TD file, there is a generator that creates kind of a parser. Or something. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, so this code that we looked at, like the annoying uh, func op to see what kind of arguments it takes, and this is all generated by uh, machinery. So, and here, let me find that. So you can, you can generate this parser thing and then this parser takes your Ruby bytecode and spits out a MLIR Oops. file, right? Yeah, yes. So this TD file, uh, yeah, I think I missed this part. I should have, should have mentioned that. Uh, sorry for confusion. So what happens with this TD file is that you just like uh, describe whatever uh, the thing is and then uh, you can get generated code for this, like C++ code. This is automatically generated. And for the C, or for the, for the dollar something, it's this. So uh, I have it for, yeah, actually TD. So just to have an example. So there is this one receiver, state, receiver, name, arc C, and, and so on. And it's all here, like state, receiver, name, arc C, arc B. And what, what can the generator C++ code do? So it can parse the bytecode? Yes, yeah, yeah, you also get it for free. Yeah. And, and what else can it? So it emits probably MLIR code? Uh, no, MLIR is, uh, there is no MLIR code, uh, yeah. Um, 
you know, kind of like, like the thing that we see in the deep dark out of right? Yes, yeah. So this, this thing describes uh, this stuff. This? This stuff here. The upper one. Yeah. So I defined lot i operation, a lot self, call, and uh, so there I kind of de define, describe the shape of, of the intermediate presentation, the form, how it looks like, like the, the schema. And then like programmatically, I filled it in and created this uh, ant program that contains these concrete instructions, like concrete operations. I think it's a bit like a JSON schema where you present yeah. you have this and this and this class and then it generates those class, but then it can also serialize it to this or deserialize it to this, but then if you want to get a ruby to this, you need to get like manually, you need to take the ruby and just you have more like a type C++ thing to, to express when you have like load i in your load i instruction in your Ruby bytecode, then, yeah. you, then you need to convert it back to the MLI, or then you use some C++ code, which is typed basically, so that's, that's what it gives. Yeah, that's one thing that it gives. Uh, the other, that there, there is a huge infrastructure for uh, some analysis and, and transformations. So, uh, one of the parts here, yeah, um, yeah, I'm getting a bit lost myself, sorry. Um, so what is what is the parts you wrote for yourself? You wrote the TD file, and with the TD file you can generate this transformation from the Ruby bytecode. Can we stay with the debug output? Uh, let me. Yeah. So the, you you start with the Ruby bytecode, right? Yes. And the TD file describes the transformation from the bytecode into the next representation? No, no, no. It only describes uh, the form, like what is, okay, like, how it can it look the like. Okay, yeah. the And Wait, a TD file is like a TD file is, TD file in, in, is in TD file. Uh, it is, pos is it possible to um, define direct, right? Yes. So yeah. This, yeah. this load operation is a direct direct that you, you, you define, right? Yeah. yeah and yeah. Uh, this is like a, a sm load operation is like a small graph, right? Mm -hmm. We can we can see this like small graph, mm -hmm. right? partial graph, and we in here here uh, you define the, the input edge and the output edge. Right? Yeah. 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 But but but, um, but, but um, how to define the actual structure of the graph? Where, where do you define it? Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, it's here. So this is another piece of code that is written manually. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I wanted to show another example, but I'm just going to skip that as well. So yeah, this is how it, uh, how it looks like. So it's still like manual work. Uh, maybe there is like a way to do it uh, automatically. I just don't know about this way. So as with that other like C compiler, where I did emit C code like this, like using Clang API, uh, kind of make a call with whatever arguments and so on. Here I did the same, but I generate the uh, instructions, uh, MLIR uh, operations. Mm -hmm. So, and, yeah. Uh, my question is how to define, so where do you, so I think you have to write like a manual realizer, right? Yes. To lower load, load, load operation to a little bit MLIR, right? Yeah, so yeah. Where do you define the realizer, you are the uh, that it's all like manual. Um, yeah. Manual. Yeah. 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 Where? So. Uh. Yeah. I'll show that. I'd like to see the implementation of the. Of 
Yeah, so this is kind of the, the, the final part of this uh, tiny compiler that I wanted okay, to show. Okay, the, so the first. I have to wait for that. No, uh, no uh, I don't think I'm going to continue with the live coding. Uh, that is like way too much confusion, I think. Uh, so sorry about that. Um, yeah, we were here. Convert. Uh, Convert. Okay, that's the wrong word. Um, anyhow, um, yeah, so step by step. Okay, the first part is uh, we take the bytecode from Ruby. So here, just read the AST and uh, generate the bytecode. And then in this function, like huge switch, or small in this case, it goes through every instruction and generates specific uh, operation that I defined in the TD file. So once I have this module here, I can do something with this module. In this case, I'm just converting it like right away to the LLVM uh, module. Then, so this, this part, I here I describe like every, for every instruction, there is like lowering thing, like conversion. Yeah, it's also, yeah, it's called conversion pattern. And then I just recreate this, this instruction uh, I take like the original instruction and I just recreate this in, yeah, in a way of some other instruction. So here I can, for example, uh, create like more instructions than, than one. I can create like five or I can just eliminate it completely. Um, so this is done and with, so from this part, I can go to the machine code. I can generate all the ambit code and then we are like at the machine level where I can just link it together with the runtime and get the, out the executable. So is this easier than emitting LVMIR directly from your first, like in, in the first step instead of gen generating MLIR? Yeah, in this example, like it doesn't make sense to do what, what uh, I've been showing. Like it's like totally a waste of time and energy. Uh, but I do believe it does uh, make sense like in, in more like in a bigger bigger example so for example um, it, it, it makes sense if, if the MLIR representation is a representation where you can do like optimizations right yes this is where I want to get to because so, I mean was what the project Yes, because you don't lose so much information. Like MLI and LLVMIR is a very low level format where you where you lost a lot of information. And yeah. this is not the same with MLIR. You can have arbitrary detail in there because you define the dialect yourself. Yes, yeah, there are some, let's see if it's here. I mean, what, what I've shown, like, uh, yeah, like the other disclaimer that I should have put in the beginning that I'm not an expert in MLIR, like whatsoever, I'm just learning it. And uh, there it's like, it's huge actually. So what I shown, it's like super small part of it. Um, but the other part that uh, you can define certain uh, traits for the operations, for example, and this one, like, whatever okay sugar it's like some uh, fake operation by the law itself this is like very real opcode that you can see in the uh, bytecode from ruby and i can just mark this as no side effect mm -hmm. and then i just whatever i i just create this uh, dialect like a malayar thing then i tell malayar like to run some optimizations on it some like default optimizations and it, it will just eliminate these instructions for example completely Okay, yes. and, and, and can you run optimizations on your dialect? Yes. Okay, you don't need to transform it to some standard dialect in order no, to... No, It obviously it. depends on, on the optimization, right? So if there is uh, mm. optimization that like remove no side effects operations, okay, or whatever. Okay, so general... Can you yeah, it, it will just do. Mm. Um, if uh, if there is some like Ruby specific optimization I, I invent, uh, then I would have to write it myself for, for this stuff. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, just, uh, so this is from, from the other kind of compiler, SSA. Uh, 
Yeah, because this opcode, uh, like bytecode, it's not, uh, it, does, it, it doesn't have a control flow graph in it. It doesn't have like SSA uh, in it. So I have to reconstruct it here. Um, but... You yeah. reconstruct what exactly? SSA and control flow graph. I, I, so I built, um, yeah, this is where the drawing and all, uh, right? So what we've been doing now it's on the left and on the right uh, we're drawing the, the rest of the fucking all uh, because this bytecode he, uh, here where was it no that's yeah this one yeah okay it's yeah it, it's a bad example uh, of course uh, there are no jumps or whatsoever uh, but if I want to like to do the analysis, so for example, there are like byte code, there are cases when you have some like super weird Ruby code, like with if else, unless, break, whatever, some branches, and then you get some dead instructions, like completely like five instructions are just dead. They're not being executed, they are just uh, kind of waste, but it's super easy to, to eliminate those. And uh, one of the kind of super straightforward optimizations I've got is move up elimination this is the one I implemented um, I mean implemented uh, so there is uh, in the bytecode there is move operation that just copies value from A to B but as we are in the SSA uh, there is just no point of having the move so I can just have like collect all the move instructions replace the users and just like eliminate them like completely erase them um, more or less. Yeah. Okay. Um, what's that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's uh, unfortunately about it. Um, the, the remaining LVMIR, can we uh, run that with, with LLI or anything? Can we compile that to... Um, I, I don't know if we can run this with LLI, but I mean, we can certainly do it like this. Let me... Because the risk code, it just, it's compiled into, it's saved into the bitcode file on the disk. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. this is like the final LVMIR. And then I've got, oops, uh, another folder. And in this folder, I actually wired everything together. So this, for example, hello RB, boots, whatever. If I run, uh, Hello RB dot XA. Then okay, yeah, it crashes of course. <laughs> um, unsupported. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I don't support all the operations, and apparently, yeah, there is only lot I, which I guess three hundred doesn't fit it. So let's say like two hundred. Oh yeah, yeah. That's the the last part of the runtime that I also wanted to have in the live coding session, but here we go. Yeah, so this is the program. It's like completely compiled to the machine code from the bytecode um, through the MLIR, LVMIR, and then, yeah, object files. Which part did you have to implement in the runtime? Like, what is the, what part of Ruby can't you? Um, anything that is not exposed to the standard uh, runtime, like through the standard API. So for example, this is not needed. I don't need to implement this. I don't need to implement this. Like, because this like, in fact, just calling um, like this function. So I could have, uh, so here, it's, it's kind of up to me what to do, right? Um, so when I lower load I instruction, then I say, okay, now this is a call to a function, yeah. uh, RT load I. Yeah. 
and it must be present in at, at like in yeah. the runtime library uh, yeah. later. But I could have just used it like MRB, whatever fixed name value and so on. But I think if I and who would have defined that one? I would have defined that one. <laughs> so that that's also like the the runtime part is also on me. Um, or like on, on you if you are building a compiler. Um, yeah, this is, I didn't figure it out yet. So Ruby, yeah, it, it has garbage collector, but it's like super primitive one, at least in the MRuby. Um, yeah, the MRuby is like kind of small, like embedded uh, Ruby. Uh, it's like super tiny, like, I mean, it's kind of, yeah. It's small and simple to follow, uh, and the MRI, like the official Ruby, uh, the C Ruby, it's like super hard uh, and much yeah tougher to to work with uh, from like this perspective. And so this is the runtime for the other kind of more realistic Ruby compiler. Um, so there are like a few more functions. Uh, and what kind of functionality does it implement? Uh, yeah, so most of it is basically. Um, vm.c if i go to the virtual machine memory management or no 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 Me memory management like does not really exist uh yeah where is it vm run yeah so this vm run no um okay vm exec yes i think this should be one yeah, so this is the huge switch uh, in the interpreter that does something. And for most of the parts, uh, so yeah, this runtime, kind of runtime, it's it's mostly me just copy pasting <laughs> this code and making it work because these things are not necessarily exposed uh, mm -hmm. through the like API of the uh, Ruby because you don't like, you don't want to, you know, change the stack size or whatever, extend the stack and so on. So things are hidden. Um, yeah, so it's mostly just copy pasting stuff and commenting things until it compiles and works. Okay, the Ruby itself, and Ruby has a runtime, a standard official runtime? Uh, guess, or like it's, it's all the same with the virtual machine? Yeah, it's all the same, yeah. It's, I mean, what I mean by runtime is like the standard libraries sort of thing. Like libc, like c has a runtime, right? It's a libc. And all the API, like you have whatever string functions and so on, this is like the c runtime, you're working with the c runtime. And the same goes for Ruby. Does it make sense? Kind of. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So here, by by runtime, I mean that it's it's a way to interact with with the virtual machine, like with the like status of the program, like with the state of the program. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as I said, this part is mostly copy paste. Uh, some things I had to implement, like. Um, yeah, maybe this one. I mean, yeah, it also helps to uh, to implement this as separate functions because then I can put some breakpoints, for example, somewhere mm -hmm. in between. Because uh, the first version that I wrote, like completely, like that was emitting C code. There, it was like super nice to debug because I have the C code. I can put breakpoints. I can see what exactly what is happening. But when I go to the like uh, machine code level, it's like much harder to debug. There are no, no, no variables, like you just work with registers and, and so on. So that's annoying. Um. Okay, I have a question. Yeah, I, I, I want to make the, the, the way free for other questions, sorry, <laughs> we were discussing. So this uh, could be yeah, called, is it like a stack bed or register bed? Uh, so this, the MRuby VM is register based and it's uh, one of the one of the reasons uh, I decided to, to work in this com to, to build this compiler. Uh, so MRI or C Ruby, it has stack based register, uh, stack okay. sorry stack based uh, bytecode. So for example, the dot i instruction would take some integer and create that register. In in M Ruby. Yes. In, uh, oh, like the base. 
just any load I instruction that you see here. Right? Yeah, uh, hold on, hold on. Yeah, let's let just uh, t take a look at this, at the right code. Yeah, okay. So this, uh, in the MRuby, a lot I would take this number 50 and put it into register R2. And then you're converting to something in the load I instruction, but then those register the other register or the it's it's always like some constant register. You you cannot uh, so you cannot have it like uh, load like fifty into R two and then load ninety nine into uh, the contents of you, you cannot have indirect address here. Yeah, but my question is: so you're calling the runtime load i and then for this runtime into the play with those register of the actual hardware register of the CPU or those abstract register of the Yeah, these are... Um, okay, so when the interpreter runs the command, or like when Ruby runs in general, uh, there is always a stack, uh, and every method has some stack associated with it. And so uh, when the virtual machine, like this VM exec, like this huge switch, when it, it runs this uh, command, it just puts 50 into the second uh, element on, on that stack of that function. Um, so in, in the compilation that I'm doing, I don't use the registers uh, yet at least, or it, I, I did use them uh, with C version uh, because it was easier there. Uh, but with the MLIR stuff, I'm using like SSA values that are living on the stack and I'm not touching any any VM stacks. Where? Here? Yes. The, these are like virtual registers, uh, like, I mean, speaking like in LLVM terms, uh, this is like virtual registers. So you need to map R2 to this person Yeah, yeah. So I have to reconstruct the SSA and here, uh, yeah. Uh, let me get another one. Yeah. Ah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Anyways. Or. Ah, uh, yes, in, in the wrong place. Copy. Yeah, so this is another example, like uh, what Ruby does, it puts like 10 into register two, then it uses it, then it overrides the register with uh, new value and do it again. And with uh, LLVM, like with the, with MLIR or LLVM, you cannot do it because everything is in SSA form. So I yeah had to reconstruct the SSA thing. Uh, yeah, there was the compiler. Yeah, um, well, if the runtime uses the, so th mm, with these functions, uh, there is still like the stack is still present. Like the, the runtime stack, I don't know, like there are two stacks, right? Like the kind of, I mean the C stack, right? And the VM stack. And uh, the VM stack is still present, but I'm not using it. Everything is on the like C stack. Uh, and there are cases like I still need to figure it out, figure out like how do I solve this problem? Uh, because there are some functions like the, I'm just calling the Ruby runtime function and it tries to read values from the stack, but they are not there because I'm not using them. And it just gives out some garbage. Yeah, I'm still not sure if I can pull this project because it's like, uh, yeah, not not a trivial thing to do. 
can I can I confirm my understanding about uh, memory management? So basically, we can define the mem memory management itself, right? In the in the layer, because some language uses uh, garbage collection, some language uses uh, just uh, reference counting. So we can implement either, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, are there any other questions? Oh, yeah. yeah. Can you maybe um, elaborate a little bit more on the process of. Um, so, first, I guess you have the bytecode, and then with the bytecode in mind, you then model your. Uh, what's it called? This, um, your own dialect, your TD file, right? Dialect, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Can you maybe, I don't know, show an example of how you would. So, you have this load i thingy, and I guess then you would you have like a load i node somewhere in your TD yeah yeah um i also uh, yeah i have it uh, so it's, it's here um so it takes the number so the what, what this lot i does it takes a constant value and produces a movie value that holds this constant constant uh, it, it, it creates the mruby object, like ruby object, mm -hmm. uh, that contains this constant. Mm -hmm. And so the, this is what uh, this uh, kind of instruction or operation, uh, this is what it describes. So as an argument, it takes uh, the state of the runtime and the number, and it gives back some value, like ruby value, ruby object. How did you define MRD op, like the, the thing you are inheriting from? Uh, yeah, this is just like some general thing to. Um, I could have just done it like like this, right? Uh, I think it's it's kind of shortcut. Like this is the way you define. Okay, and op is uh, predefined. Yeah, yeah, op is coming from the standard library, uh, standard MLAR library. It's yeah, predefined thing. And there are like lots of predefined things. Okay, are, are there any, I don't know, more advanced concepts like in um, TD that you didn't show yet? If, yeah, yeah, I mean, there are many. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, I didn't even try to show uh, all of them. I, I didn't know all of them uh, myself. Um, no, no, this one here. Uh, no, that's... Okay, yeah, I, I have it opened here, actually. MLAR dialect affine. Ah, uh, no, just want to open it. Yeah, so it looks a bit more advanced already. Um, but yeah, this is the documentation, this part. But you can like do like lots of crazy things like uh, e there are also options like to define your own parser and uh, kind of uh, parser and printer for, for your types, operations and so on. And you can have here some C++ code inlined in these things. Like, yeah, this is just a constructor. Okay, this is kind of straightforward. Uh, but maybe I can find it somewhere here. Yeah, I think for example, this one. So it's, uh, it's defining its own printer or parser or something. And these are kind of variables. So it's like template engine um, in, in here. So this is the other, I mean, uh, yeah, to me it all looks advanced, like I, I don't understand what's going on there. Okay. Yeah, uh, there, there are tutorials actually, I can, oops, burns my eyes now. Um, yeah. There does that also mean that uh, you could have written, uh, you could have used the TD file to write a parser for the Ruby byte code? Uh, no, I don't think so, no, no. Um, 
maybe in some simple cases yes but i cannot uh, i cannot see at least how i can do that uh because um I mean, if we were to create our own generators from KDGen, we could also do that from KDGen. It's probably not generic enough. Uh, table gen? I mean, you could always create your own generators and then define all your operations in table gen and have your code created. But then you have to instead create the generator. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yes. So, uh, I mean, I guess it could. could you can do something like that, but so here, like it's simple, uh, like load i is that simple, load self is also simple, but in like in reality, uh, there are some like crazy, I don't know, more crazy cases, like, uh, I don't know. Yeah, maybe actually now looking at it uh, from the side, Maybe it could have been automated more. Yeah, like this is more um, custom thing than than the the rest the rest small operations. Yeah, um, I don't know. So maybe it's possible to do it. I just don't know how to do it, uh, like in general, and I don't know how to do it with stable gen as well. It, so far it feels like uh, crafting this manually uh, is easier. Yeah, like this stuff, like generate operation based on what you see in the registers and so on. So this is not trivial, I think. Yeah, talking about advanced stuff. Um, so VM itself, it, uh, or sorry, MLAR itself, there are some tutorials. Um, there are like two links uh, with some talks, like YouTube talks and some tutorials like hands-on where you can just write some code. Uh, and there was this great uh, series of videos, how to build a compiler with LLVM and MLIR. Uh, there are like, I think 20 uh, videos. It's kind of like a course where uh, the, the outro starts with like basic concepts of the compiler, like going from the very high level from whatever parser, AST, Lexer, and going down to generating the machine code or using, uh, actually not machine code, I think, but using JIT compiler in this case. So this, I can like highly recommend this. Um, yeah, this is the link to, to the repository, to the code I use uh, today, in case you're curious. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Okay, I guess then uh, we can go downstairs and grab some, some drinks. Thank you. Yeah.